Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus, and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. It's good to see you guys today. It, wasn't this a great morning to get up? I mean, goodness gracious. It was just crisp out this morning, football weather. <laughs> if I said the words boomer, okay, just wanted to make sure there. Good to see you guys today. Hey, we're in the midst of a, Coming, actually coming to an end of a journey as we have walked through a little letter in the New Testament called Colossians that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of people, a body of Christ church that was located in uh, Colossae, which is in <clears throat> the, the uh, ruins of it anyways, in modern day Turkey. And so uh, it's kind of interesting, this little letter that Paul wrote to the, the people in this area, and he, he just presents Jesus as being supreme over everything. And he says, uh, uh, you know, in the very first part of the, that first chapter, he says, man, he, in him, he created all things for him, and by him all things were created. And then he says, all things hold together in him. That is, a, that is just an amazing phrase that he uses. All things hold together in him. And if you're here the first week, we, we discovered that God placed this little amino acid that has uh, strands look like a cross, and everything adheres around to that. That's the reason we hold together as human beings. And I, God puts all things created by Jesus to, and he holds them all together. And that just is an amazing thing. I mean, from... Uh, from galaxies to atoms, from amino acids to animals to human beings, from mountains to molehills, God holds it all together, he even holds relationships together, which to me, in my estimation, that's the toughest job of all, holding relationships together because, uh, man, it is, it is chaos sometimes in our lives, especially in the area of relationships. I mean, you know, marriage, we talk about it in so many different ways as being wedded bliss. I thought that way before I got married. My wife was convinced of that. It took her about a month to realize that uh, that wasn't necessarily true. We all struggle in relationships. Can I, isn't that right? I mean, every one of us struggle in relationships. And yet Paul today is going to discuss uh, three different primary relationships, three di different areas within lives that as we live out our life and God holds those things together, people are able to see the supremacy of Jesus in your life. It's just amazing. I mean, it, it, is, it is almost mind-boggling whenever uh, Paul tells Ryan, I mean, we, we know that People are weird, right? Do you know that? I mean, I mean, they, you know, really, they are. Um, we, um, <laughs> have you ever told stories with somebody else about how weird your family is? <laughs> I, I was at a, a preacher's conference uh, out in Arizona. It's been a few years back, and they had this game that we played, and we all talked about how weird our family was. I lost, but just barely. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, and some of you guys, I, I know your families, and they are cuckoo. I don't know what else to say about it, you know? We all have weirdness within our families. My, my grandma, Sweeney, I love her. She was just an important person within my life. Four foot seven Irish lady with a fiery temper. Uh, but for holidays, she would invite people that we didn't know off the street to eat with us. Okay, and there are times that we came in, I'm, you know, really young, we always ate Thanksgiving and Christmas and any other major holiday, we went to the Sweeney family and, and she was a great cook, but we didn't know who was gonna be at the table. We didn't know whether they would be just about passed out drunk 
or, or they would be saying some off-the-wall things that my mom was putting her fingers in my ear, and I didn't understand what that was all about. But it was just kind of a weird experience. Maybe you've had, you know, a weird uncle that shows up at your Thanksgiving table and going, yeah, what is he? maybe it's you that shows up at Thanksgiving. <laughs> no, that, that's what he's talking about. But families and people are just kind of, of weird, you know? And I, and I think that uh, one of the things that I marvel at is that we all know that families are beautiful and challenging and awkward, but they're also God's design. And one of the things that happens in families is that whenever you create your own family, your family of origin informs you about the roles that you will play. You begin to live like a husband or like a wife, and it's informed, your role is informed, that's all, the training that you've had was your family of origin. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's a little weird, you know? And families create expectations of what you, the new family constellation is going to be like. But the Bible actually talks about these expectations. You've probably heard it said, if love is blind, marriage is the eye opener, right? You've heard that? Or if a man is incomplete until he gets married, then he's finished. <laughs> Done for, right there. So I don't know whether any of those things are true, but if you search uh, marriage jokes, you'll find these and mostly other pessimistic uh, cliches about wedded non-bliss within there. Now, marriage is an easy target. I can't say for sure that's true, but it's certainly a common one. I, I believe that marriage is one of God's most brilliant and ridiculous ideas. Brilliant because no relationship provides greater opportunity for growth than marriage. It's, it's brilliant because it's in marriage where the pressure gets applied to us and reveals the cracks in our lives and we, we have to deal with it. Uh, ridiculous <laughs> because it trusts um, actual human beings with such delicate and generation alterating possibilities as realities. But marriage stands near the center of God's purposes for the world and atop Paul's household instructions. Now, several times in the New Testament, God will say to him, this is best for you. If, you. if you act like this, if you develop this character, things will go better for you. Husbands develop this character. Uh, wives, if, when you display these characteristics, your family and a watching world will see Jesus in you. Now, I, I want you to know this morning, I am not promoting a leave it to beaver family. Now, I say that and I look at the audience and part of you, some of you don't have a clue what leave it to beaver is. And if you don't know, go ask your grandparents and they'll probably tell you about this great sitcom in, in the 50s and 60s. But there's, there's no perfect families. There's no perfect models. Some of you have great families and you, you have come out of chaos in a situation and God has placed you within a blended family and you're doing a, a beautiful job of that. Some of you are single parents and you're doing a sensational job, but it's tough. It's really tough to be a single parent. Some grandparents or even great grandparents are raising kids. And it's, you don't have the energy that you used to have, but you are doing a grand job of it. I want to say, my applause is for you. There is no one right way to do it, but there are attitudes that God trains us or wants to train us to have us express towards other people. Now, please keep in mind, Paul is not just issuing commands that we are called to follow in our own strength. God is currently, with, if you are a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit lives within you, and he is currently working in us to transform us so that we can be increasingly more like he originally designed us to be, what he originally intended for us. We are being restored to the original destiny that God had in mind for us. Now, this morning, we're investigating on how these relationships of marriage and parenting and work relationships, how these things reveal Jesus Christ in your life and in your family as the goat to a watching world. Three areas that we're going to talk about. The first one is marriage. Uh, and when you talk about marriage, when you ask the question, I, I, I don't know how many 
weddings I've performed in 50 plus years of ministry, but I know that I filled up the book that was given to me when I was ordained and a second one along the way. So it's a lot of marriages that I've performed. Most of those marriages I've done premarital counseling with, uh, four to six sessions. Um, my master's degree areas in clinical psychology, specialized in families. And so I've, I've done a lot of work in this area. And when we talk about the original design for marriage, whenever uh, you're talking about the original design, what's the purpose of marriage? The conversation generally gets boiled down to this. I know that I'm, I'm going to make my wife really happy. And she believes that too. <laughs> or I, I just know that I'm going to make my husband the happiest person on earth. And a lot of you guys have bought into that lie too. It's not true. You can't do that. It's impossible for you to make somebody else happy. It's impossible. It is, it is such a crushing weight on your shoulder to think that you can make somebody else happy and they live in happiness. That is the biggest lie that you can, you can dream up because we're each responsible for our own happiness. Ooh, I don't like that. I think it's all my wife's fault because she doesn't make me happy. Well, it's a convenient person to blame, but really you're the one to blame. And so the original idea for marriage is not to make your spouse happy. Oh, some of you go, freedom! <laughs> I don't have to make him happy. You're right, you can't do that. But there are some other ideas that God does place upon your shoulders that will help immensely within your relationship within marriage. And, and, and uh, precursor to this whole conversation about marriage and parenting and children and work uh, is this statement in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 that uh, we talked about last week, but it's really the key to this whole next section. It says this. Would you read it with me? All right. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of, our, of the Lord Jesus. All right. So what Paul is saying, it doesn't matter what you do. Everything you do is to be in the name of Jesus. Basically, that means you represent the name of Jesus as you're doing it. You're, you and I are here to make Jesus famous. You're not here to make your company famous, your family famous, you famous. You are here to make Jesus famous. And whenever you do that, and people outside look inside your home and see Jesus, they're going, wow, what is this all about? It's a difference maker. We all have this idea and somewhere in the back of our mind that marriage is going to make us a wonderful person. <laughs> You're not laughing. <laughs> you ought to be. Because God is the only one that can make you, ha make you happy, is to make you a wonderful person. Somebody else can't do that for you. And this is so, cre this is so important because we live and we breathe and we move and we love in the name of Jesus, aiming with our words and our deeds to make him famous. And this is critically important because whether you recognize it or not, and most people don't recognize it, your family, hear me now, your family is a sermon without words to your neighbors and your friends and other family. Whatever you do includes the way you treat your spouse. Whatever you do includes how you act or react whenever you're at work. Do outsiders see Jesus when they see inside your home? Do outsiders see Jesus when they see inside your home? The purpose of marriage is to show to the world what God's love looks like in action. Because it is the, marriage is the most intense of all relationships. Can I get an amen on that? Some of you are going, amen. Yeah, it's intense, all right, brother. Can I escape? Now, today, we want to talk about how you can preach a sermon without words that displays Jesus very well. Now, I, I want you to know that as we read through this passage, we've got some barriers that we've got to overcome this morning. There are four statements that Paul makes, and out of those four statements, down through the years, they have triggered anxiety in other people. A couple of them uh, trigger anxiety back in the first century when he first wrote them. Others 
trigger anxiety today in our life. So as we read this, I, I really want to urge you that when you hear certain words said, don't go, ah, and start putting fingers in your ear, okay? I want you to listen to them and see what Paul is actually saying before you get all psyched out about it. Can you do that with me? Can, can, I, can, you, can I rely and say yes or no? Okay, all right, guys, some of you are nodding your heads, others over you are crossing your arms, so I just know what I'm dealing with this morning, okay? So, here we go. First words. Let's go to the next slide. Wives, I think we hit the first trigger right here. <laughs> Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. I don't think there's many, you know, sometimes at least, I'll just say that this is my wife. My wife often writes on lipstick on our mirror verses that she is memorizing and she's wanting to put in practice. I don't think I've ever seen that one up there. I don't think it's one that often you, you see up there. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Second thing, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, do you want to guess in the first century when Paul originally wrote this letter? Now, here, I'm going to throw this in for free, okay, this morning, all right? I want you to realize, and some of us haven't grasped this important, um, I'm going to say hermeneutical is a big word, but, but this rules for interpretation for uh, ancient literature, all right? First of all, this letter to the Corinthians was not written to you first. All right, it doesn't say to James McCracken of 1700 West Johnny. It says to the saints who are gathered together in Colossae, all right? So it was written to them first. And when you're trying to understand and interpret the Bible, it was not written to you in the 21st century first. It was written, first of all, to a group of Christians in Colossae at that time. And he was speaking into their culture system at that time. And when they read this, Wives submit to your husband, it didn't bother anybody at all. The only thing that it bothered was some people thought, wives don't even have to know that. They don't have to, it shouldn't be even there first. What triggered them was the second one, which says, husbands love your wives and don't be harsh with them. In the Roman world at that time, husbands had complete authority over life and death. When a child was born, the husband could say, and they killed the child immediately. Gone. And generally, if it was a female, that's what they would do. And so whenever he says, husbands, love your wives, the men at that time go, nah, 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 nah. I don't want to hear that. Just like we often do, wives, when you hear the word submit. But to them, that's what triggered them. And so you've got to understand the context that sometimes things are emphasized, but they are still true. And so Paul, whenever he says, wives, submit to your husbands, as fitting to the Lord, he is saying to you, guys, uh, wives, there is a role that you need to play in relationship. Doesn't make you any worse or any better, one way or the other. And when the, while sub, word submit may seem scandalous today, there was no scandal in Paul's day at all. So in the end, Paul, what he says isn't really complex. Marriage works best when husbands sacrificially serve, good, good term for how you love your wife, sacrificially serve your wives, and wives gently respect their husbands. Paul addresses both husbands and wives who are followers of Jesus to take responsibility for their contribution to healthy homes, to be Jesus to each other in the home so that when outsiders see inside your home, they see Jesus. Husbands, you and I are not told to say, you better submit to me. You better respect me. No, that was not written to you. That was written to your wife. It was not written to you. And it's not to any woman that you see that you think that you ought to demand that they submit to you at all. It said not to the exhortation to the husbands is, husbands, love your wife and do not be harsh, some versions say bitter, or angry with her when she turns out to be just like you, a real human being. So sometimes it's angry, and sometimes it's harsh, sometimes it's critical. 
She is not merely a projection of your own hopes or fantasies. Husbands, love your wives. Why? Because they're always lovable. Not that I've ever personally met a woman that was unlovely, but uh, theoretically speaking, all right, there is a moment where a woman could be unlovely. And wives, you don't respect your husbands because they deserve respect. <laughs> you respect your husband because he needs to be respected. Well, he's just not respectable. I, I, I get that. I've been one. I, I am one at times. But I need Tria to respect me. On the rare occasion when she does not respect me, I want to tell you, it just crushes me. Now, I'm, I'm a pretty confident dude. Some of you who know me say he's really overconfident, so is the issue with that. But I'm a pretty confident person. But I want to tell you that when my wife does not respect me, it crushes me as confident as I think I am. Why? Because I want to be your hero. I need her respect. Husbands, you don't love your wives because she's lovable. You love your wife because she needs to be loved. And I have never met a wife, and I've done thousands of counseling sessions, I've never met a wife who didn't need to be loved and valued and cherished. So you give your wife what she needs, not what she deserves. It's a strange idea, isn't it? It's exactly what Jesus has done for us. Aren't you glad that Jesus does not give you what you deserve? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. God gives us grace when we do not deserve that grace. And he just keeps flooding it towards us over and over and over again. There's a book that I'd love for you to read, and uh, there's a... If you, belong, if you belong to Boulevard, you get a free subscription to what's called Right Now Media. And you can go on that, and this guy by the name of Emerson Egerich, I know it's a crazy name, but he's, done, he's written a great book, he and his wife. Uh, they are marriage counselors. Um, he, uh, he and his wife interviewed 7,000 marriages, 14,000 people. And one of the questions they asked, they asked, was this, and I want to get it right, what I, they say. When you're in conflict with your spouse or significant other, do you feel unloved or disrespected? Do you feel unloved or disrespected? Over 70% of the women said unloved. Over 80% of the men said disrespected. Hmm. Apparently, Paul knew something about how marriage works in every era and every culture. Now, if you want to read this book, you can buy it through our bookstore, you can go on Amazon, or you can see a, a film video series that he has done by getting onto Right Now Media. If you do not have Right Now Media, call the office, we can tell you how to sign up for that, okay? Now, you know, God, you need to understand this doesn't mean that men don't need love and women don't need respect. Both matter to all of us. But marital breakdown typically begins when husbands fail to sacrificially love their wives or when wives disrespect their husbands. And it sets in motion a destructive back and forth cycle that just squeezes the life out of marriage. And God is so wise about this. When you provide the other with what they need, they can become what God wants them to become. When we empower people in our families to be better versions of themselves, when wives respect their husbands, believe it or not, we become more respectable. Isn't that amazing? Some of you are going, that's not possible. Everything's possible with God. And when you, guys, when you love your wives sacrificially, they become the best, best version of themselves. They become what God originally designed for them. If your marriage is hurting, hear me please, get help today. Marriage is far too important and life is too short to passively allow your home to descend further 
and further and further away from God's design. Do whatever it takes to make things right, and God will not only increase, not only increase your ability to be in your joy, but also work through your Christ-centered family to bring life and healing to others. Do outsiders see Jesus when they see inside your home? Area number two, parenting. I want to tell you, October is a wild month for the McCracken family. Um, my youngest daughter, daughter number three for us, I was born in October. Her, her birthday is a week from Saturday, it's actually on Monday. And uh, so she will turn, I won't tell you how old she is because she might kill me. Uh, today, my wife is in McAllister because grandson number one is celebrating his 11th birthday. Then on the, on, uh, uh, on the 17th, uh, granddaughter number five is celebrating her, her birthday. And uh, gosh, on the 19th of October, I file for a um, home loan so I can pay for all the presents that I'm buying in October. It's, it's a crazy time, you know? But, I, I, but it's, it's fun in some ways to see the differences in our kids. Isn't that, isn't that a kind of an interesting thing? Mallory is our youngest one, and she, she was so much fun to be around. I mean, she... She was, uh, she was just, a, in many ways, a joy to be around. She was very easy to uh, discipline. Couldn't say that about her two older sisters. Um, but she was easy to discipline. She wanted to please, and she, she was just had fun in the things that she did, you know. Um, <laughs> she, she, was, uh, she was kind of my pal when, we were, when I was teaching her. We, we loved to go skiing. And, and we had fun doing it, and she was always right by my side, imitating how I crouched and did different things, you know. She was the one who, um, when we would read to our kids before they would go to bed every night and then pray with them, and she wanted to, I, I like to kind of enliven the books a little bit and put voices to whatever characters I was reading and things like that, and she would imitate that. She loved the book, The Pokey Little Puppy. Anybody ever heard of The Pokey Little Puppy? horrible values in that book, but it is fun to read, you know. I mean, he gets away with all this stuff till the end, and she would say, she'd say, the pokey little puppy, you know, and you just, aw. And then she would, uh, uh, whenever he didn't, at the end he was caught, and she'd say, and you get no re dessert tonight. Isn't that right, Daddy? And I'd say, yes, that's right. You know, it was, it was fun, but she was also a little demanding at times. Like, uh, when she was born, it was a busy, busy season in our life. I would oftentimes get home, and I would be very tired, and she would come in, sit down right up on my lap before I get a chance to, you know, unline right with then. She would start talking to me, and Mallory is incessant talker. She will talk and talk and talk and talk and look. And sometimes my brain would just turn off, and all of a sudden she would look at me, and she'd put one hand on my cheek and the other on the other one, and she'd say... Daddy James, I'm talking to you. Listen and pay attention. <laughs> I, I couldn't kill her at that time, but, uh, but she was just one of those fun children that was, was easy to raise. Not all children are like that, you know? Um, we all know this, that cute children often grow up to be bratty teenagers. And even, sometimes they grow up to be evil adults. Now, you may not... Re say that and may not like the starkness of that, but most of us as parents try our best to avoid complete disaster. But it isn't easy, uh, even though most parents try to avoid that, and it, we, it, because we know how much is riding on the line, and we don't get a daily score to evaluate our performance or measure our progress. Maybe this is why parenting styles can be such a lightning rod conversation topic. If you don't believe me, walk into a room of new parents, especially new moms, and say, should we spank our kids? Woo, baby. You're going to get an earful. You just sit back and watch. And soon you realize that maybe parenting styles ought to be put with, you know, politics and religion as things you don't bring up unless you want to start a fight. 
But there are a few places, listen to me, there are a few places that distill the wisdom of parenting as succinctly as this passage in Colossians chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. It says this, children, be obedient to your parents in all things. That triggers some today because what do you mean children to be parents? What if their, their parents are horrible people? Are they supposed to be obedient to that? As a general rule, though, there needs to be some sense of who is the one leading the pack in a family, and that is parents. Then he goes on to say fathers. Now, why does he say fathers here? Well, because fathers had all the authority in the family at the time he was writing it. And he says, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Now, dads, does that make you more important than mom in the family? No. But I think sometimes, especially in the culture in which we live today, Dads are portrayed within media and literature, especially today, as being stupid, ignorant, unable to think for themselves, and just kind of float along in life. And that's a tragedy, because dads play a huge role in the growing up of your children. The statistics just bringing it out so often within our lives. You know, it is, it is interesting, the statistics, what they say about um, dads and how important they are in the family. Almost 80%, 80% of young men in prison come from homes where there's no fathers present. Fatherlessness, the kind where fathers are literally gone, as well as the kind where dads might as well be gone, is one of the most crippling social ills of our time. 70% of those who die of drug overdose come from homes with no father presence in the home. 65% of suicide victims lived in fatherless homes. Dads, I know you're busy. We already feel like we're doing our best and we fear is not good enough. We might be great with numbers, we may be good with machines or customers, but we fear incompetence more than we fear death. And most of us have got to face the fact, and the fact is we have some, one simple choice. Either engage with your families and lead them spiritually or watch them drift further and further away from God who sent his only son to die for them. Dads and moms, if you've walked out on your family, do whatever it takes to make it right. And don't expect your re-entry, whether literally moving back into the home or moving back into their lives to be easy or smooth. They may harbor bitterness towards you as you may towards them. But we don't have any other option. Satan is winning the battle as we stay passive. There are two tips that Paul gives to, to parents. First, he says, don't be harsh. Build your kid's sense of worth, their sense of value. Don't tear them down. Try doing something to the opposite of harsh. Have some fun with your kids. Think of some way to have fun with your kids, something that they like to do. You don't have to coach your kids every time you throw the ball with them in the backyard. You can just play catch. You can let them make up imaginary games that would destroy baseball otherwise, but let them have some fun. Discover what your child likes to do and do it with them. I, I, uh, my dad was, was a hard worker, and he, he was a mechanic. He loved to take things apart. He loved to tinker with cars. Our cars growing up had every gas-saving device on them, even though it didn't make the car any more efficient whatsoever. He had to put them on it. He loved to do that. He loved to create work in the yard. Our front yard was a master gardener. We had roses, we had all different kinds of flowers. The, the, the lawn was cut a certain thing. It was always nice and thick. You loved to go barefoot in the front yard. The backyard was a different matter. My dad loved mechanics and this stuff. He was okay with sports. I lived and breathed sports when I was growing up. There wasn't a sport that I didn't like that I didn't want to participate in. We had, a, we had an empty lot next to us. On my block, there were 
six guys that were in three, three, years of each, three years of age within each other. You go two blocks more, we gained four more guys. In the summertime, we got up and we did the chores that our parents made us do, and then we played baseball all day long into the night. My dad set up spotlights so it would, it would show the field. We practiced sliding into second, sliding into third. Our yard was a mess in the backyard. When it would rain, there'd be these muddy areas, which then we would go mud sliding. We'd just go run and jump out and slide through the mud and just be a, a mess. My mom couldn't stand it, and Dad'd say, oh, he'll clean it, he'll clean up eventually. Our neighbor, Mr. McClure, loved everything very nice around his house also. And one day, he was talking to my dad over the fence. I was about 13 at the time. And he said, Frank, I just don't understand it. Your kids, all the neighborhood kids are just destroying your yard. Your front yard looks pretty good, but man, you're, and besides that, they keep eating foul balls over into Mike Flowers all the time. Now this guy cut the lawn with one of those old rotor push mowers, you know, and had scissors that he cut around the flower bed. I mean, he just had everything immaculate. And my dad listened to him complain for a little while more, and he said, Dan, I'm not trying to grow a yard in the backyard. I'm trying to grow a son. And at 13, <clears throat> there were times that I didn't like my dad, but I knew he cared for me, and he was willing to let me have some fun as well as be disciplined. Dads, we can do that. We can see what makes our kids tick and do something with them. Second tip for parents is parents, we need to set boundaries for our kids. As parents, we need to set clear boundaries and engage in serious, appropriate discipline. Letting kids run the home has become just as much a problem as becoming too strict. Now, in the Ephesian passage that's companion to, uh, to the book to, uh, to Colossians, Paul adds this phrase. He says, don't provoke your children by anger, but raise them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Don't fall into the trap of, I'm going to let my kids find their own course in life. That's a trap. Trusting children to find their own way without proper training in Christ-centered discernment is about as wise as dropping them in the ocean before you give them swimming lessons. Again, the question is this. Do outsiders see Jesus when they look inside your home? I think there was a reason, it took me a long time to understand this, I think there was a reason why all 10 of those guys always gathered in our backyard, in our side yard. My dad could be grumpy. He didn't like it when we smashed out the windows in the garage by actually hitting balls towards the garage. But you know what? He said, we'll replace the pain. And James Frank, you're gonna do it. <laughs> Area number three, your work. Work is really not our idea. Some of us don't like work, some love work. But work was a part of God's original design for creation. We are instructed to cultivate creation's fruitfulness through organization and planning and good old fashioned blood, sweat, and tears. We are made to work. And by definition, work is good. So here's what Paul says. He says, slaves, oh, there's another one that trips us. Slaves obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of, of heart, fearing the Lord. Go ahead. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the, what's the next word? Lord, not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid for the wrong he has done, and there's no partiality for that. And go ahead to the next verse. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you ha also have a master in heaven. Oh, man, that is a tough deal. When you see the word slaves, now we do not have slavery in our country currently, at least not legally. You know why that is? It's actually because of this passage. 
This passage in Colossians and the sister letter that Paul wrote to a man who is in the Colossian church, a guy by the name of Philemon, these two letters were written by the same person, the Apostle Paul. These two letters were written to the same church, the church of Colossae. At the time they received the church, they would be so excited if I would say, we've got a letter from, from Paul today. Everyone would go, yeah, read the letter. And they would read the letter. They would probably stand with her. And go, wow. You know, and they would discuss what Paul wrote that day. He also wrote a letter to an individual by the name of Philemon. Philemon was a member of that church. That letter was also read publicly in the Colossian church. Now you say, so what big deal? Well, in this letter, it's about Philemon having a slave by the name of Onesimus. Philemon was a Christian who was also a slave owner. Didn't really know any better, and I'll tell you what, in the first century, they say anywhere between 60 to 70% of Rome was made up of slaves, the Roman Empire. And so slavery was a common thing. It was just, wasn't right, but that's the way society was at that time. And so one of Philemon's slaves ran away. His name was Onesimus. He ran away from Colossae, made his way to Rome, and when he was in Rome, he ran into the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul led him to Christ. Onesimus was, became a Christ follower. And Paul said to him, Brother O, you're a Christian now. And you've got to act like Christ now, which means that you need to submit to the authority that God has put over you, including your master. Now, why didn't Paul tell Philemon, just be free, brother O. Just be free. Don't go back there. Isn't slavery an abomination? Yes. Paul did something, I think, that was even more shrewd than that and more permanent than that. He tells Onesimus, Philemon to, to give Onesimus what he needs. And he will become what God desires him to be, what you want. He tells Onesimus to give Philemon what he needs, and he'll become what God desires him to be and that you want him to be. Paul tells Philemon, treat Onesimus as your Christian brother. Treat Onesimus as your Christian brother. If you treat someone as a brother, how long are you going to keep them enslaved? It was because of this letter that in the Roman world, when Christianity began to grow influence in the Roman world, that slavery was demolished from the inside out. And it happened again in the British Empire, and it happened so, somewhat in the Americas. When you offer to the other what they need, they often become what they want and what God desires them to be. And so this is the advice that Paul gives. Today, we don't have slaves and masters. We do have employees and employers. For all of you who are employees out there, here's what Paul says. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as, as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. How different, how different would your workplace be if Jesus were your boss? I bet you get on to work on time more often. I bet that you would work late at times more often. I bet that you would have a better attitude and not gossip around the water cooler because Jesus knows your every thoughts. I bet that you would have a better attitude if Jesus were your boss. What Paul is saying is Jesus is your boss. Your reward does not come from your employee. It can become, come straight from Jesus, who's your ultimate master. And then Paul flips it around, and he talks to the CEOs, the managers, the bosses here. And in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Employers, treat your employees with justice and fairness because you have a master in heaven. Employees, employers, what would you do for your employees if you saw them as family? Would you give compensation differently? Would days off be differently? Would the workload be different? Paul reminds employees and employers that they are working for the goat of the entire universe, not working for a paycheck. So question, do outsiders see Jesus when they look inside your workplace? 
Over the past few months, I have uh, been praying a certain prayer over and over and over again. If you were to read my journals, you would say, see, so it's what I've come to call my centering prayer. And I've been asking, God, open my eyes to see where you are working so I can join with you. Unplug my ears to hear the cries of those around me. Let me see into their faces and their actions. Realign my mind to believe that you can do something in their life. And empower me to respond in a manner that will ignite hope in their lives and see you. I want to tell you, I look around and I see hurt. I see hurt. I see people struggling with habits that defeat them, crush their homes, blow up their workplaces. And the people are hiding and attempting to power up over others. And what the common deal on that is, is often we blame somebody else for everything that we do. And we don't deal with the hurts. We don't deal with the habits. We don't deal with the hangups in our lives. So how, how will people know that they are seeing Jesus inside my home? How will people know that they're seeing Jesus inside the workplace? Will it be because you're perfect and not have any struggles? No. They would know that's fake. That's a lie. Every one of us struggle. Every one of you guys are weird. Yeah. Every one of us often try to portray an image of what we're not. How will people know they're seeing Jesus? They would know because this husband who has an anger problem admits it and is no longer blaming anyone else for it is beginning to act with humility towards his wife and not with scorn. They would see Jesus because the wife who is critical, complaining about others in the family, is now responding with grace and encouragement instead of caustic speech. There is a sense that we must come to that we realize we need a power outside of ourselves to help me overcome my stupidity. Anybody ever been stupid? <laughs> and see, we got a lot of work to do because some of you don't think you have. The way people outside will see Jesus inside is when you say and realize, I can't do it by myself. I can't. But God can. So I'll decide, I'll cooperate with him instead of trying to block him. You can do that this morning. We're going to stand and sing a song. With this song, there will be some people who will be on each side of the stage who would love to talk you through the process of you saying, I can't, but God can. I'll cooperate. I'll surrender to him. Won't you come as we stand and sing and worship together?